I feel like going on I feel like going on Though trials come On every hand I still feel like going on I just can't give up now I just can't give up now Yes, trials come on every hand, but I feel like going on. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Simple Bible Study Podcast, where we're going on. We are going on in the Word of God. So we're picking up today at Hosea, the 10th chapter. And so as you grab your Bibles, we're going to open up in a quick word of prayer. And then we're going to dive right into these 15 verses of this 10th chapter. So, Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory that's due to you. We pray, God, that you would help us to understand your word. Open our eyes, our hearts, and our understanding, Lord, that we can hear what you have for us in this great word of yours today. In Jesus' name, amen. I, Hosea 10 and 1. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Now, I have actually uh, taught on other verses that reference uh, Israel as the vine. In fact, that's a uh, that's a consistent uh, comparison throughout the scripture that Israel is called the vine, uh, the vine of God. And I've used this verse before, but I think I've used it incorrectly. Because when you look up uh, the, what it means here about being an empty vine, actually, I, I've, I always thought it meant that they were fruitless and that they uh, uh, they, they lacked fruit and, and God looked for fruit and wasn't on, on them. No, being an empty vine speaks of fruit, an abundance of fruit, actually, uh, that is, there's so much that is fallen off and is all on the ground. It's overly ripe. It speaks of Israel's abundance and prosperity. Israel here is is a, living in a prosperous time. They're doing well. Uh, the economy is good. The uh, the the grocery store has food on the on on every uh, <laughs> every aisle, plenty of it, and and everybody's doing well. And they think that because all of that prosperity is going on, because money is flowing, the stock market's up, that means that God is pleased. Well, it does not mean that, as we're going to see here. A <laughs> uh, 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 successful stock market, uh, 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 plenty of food on the shelves doesn't mean that God is pleased. And it's the same way in my nation today. We think that because we're so prosperous and we have so much money and we uh, we have all the uh, all the uh, material goods and and we've got so many luxuries that God is pleased. No, sir. Those things come because of his mercy. Those things come because of his patience. But he is warning, even as, as, a, as times appear to be good, he is warning this nation, Israel, as he's warning my nation today, that destruction is on the way if we don't turn around to him. You see, Israel, the, the more money they got, the more prosperity they had, the more sinful they became. It says uh, that he hath increased the altars. That means he was going out worshiping gods even more, these other gods, even more as he became more, more prosperous. And so this nation is in a bad place. <laughs> They're on their way down the wrong road. Now verse two says, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. In other words, God is coming. <laughs> Judgment is coming. And all these things that they delight in, they think are so good, they think are so uh, positive, but if they're not involving God, if they're against God, God is going to bring these things down. His vengeance is on the way. Now, verse 3 says, For now they shall say, We have no king, because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? 
In other words, they're a rebellious people. <laughs> they're, they're, they're heroes or rebels. They're saying we don't, we don't fear a king. We don't respect a king. We don't respect God. We don't respect nothing. We have no <laughs> respect for any type of authority. And, uh, and so that, that really starts the true breakdown of a nation. When all authority is goes without respect, it's happening in my nation, friends. Uh, I can't say what it was called, but it was uh, well. It started with an F, and it ended <laughs> the police. They would say that was that was a, a very popular phrase, uh, actually, not too too long ago in this in this nation. And uh, they were saying also. Uh, defund the police. Uh, they were saying away with any kind of authority. Why? But because we were, we become a rebellious people. That's what happened in Israel. Rebellious hearts have led to a rebellion and the true breakdown of society. Now let's read on. They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. God is very serious about people keeping their words. Uh, Jesus said over in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter five, uh, verse 30, uh, let's say 34. He says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Listen, but let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. In other words, keep your word. <laughs> if you say you're going to do something, do it. Uh, let your word be your bond. And today in my land, nobody goes by that. We don't have that code. When when I go to uh, buy something or make a loan, I got to sign a whole phone book worth of pages because nobody's word is trusted. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so we live in a day just like in Hosea's day here. It's striking how similar the day of Hosea is to our day. Uh, and so that ought to, that ought to uh, make you make you wonder if the if the judgment that was close to Hosea's day is also close in our day. And I believe it is now. Verse five, the inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the caves of Beth Avon for the people thereof shall mourn over it and the priests thereof shall, that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof because it is departed from it. Verse seven says, uh, I'm sorry, verse six says, it shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be shamed of his own counsel. Now look at how ridiculous this is. Verse five and six, they're, 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 it's talking about their, uh, their, their calf, their golden calves, the gods that they worship. There was one placed in Samaria and then there was one placed in Bethel. Or as it's called here, Beth Haven, as a as a way to mock uh, the city of Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. But since they took God out, now Hosea the prophet calls it Beth Haven. Beth Haven means the house of vanity, or the house of nothing, or the house of stupidity. I would say <laughs> it's going from the house of God to the house of stupidity. So they got their stupid gods there that they're worshiping there. At what used to be Bethel, but now is Beth Haven. And the people are going to mourn over these worthless gods that they've set up. And those gods that they set up are going to be carried to Assyria to be presented to King Jerob. Israel, Ephraim shall receive shame. Well, of course they have. If your God can be taken from you and presented to somebody else, <laughs> you got a weak and a, and a, and a whack God. You're worshiping something utterly worthless and you should be shamed of yourself. And that's what Israel was doing. And by the way, in my nation, we worship the almighty dollar. We worship how much money you can have or how many uh, cars you can drive and how much, uh, how many nice clothes you can buy and all of that. And all of that can be taken from you and presented to somebody else, just like these empty gods that Israel was worshiping. <laughs> all of that can be gone in a minute and you'll feel like a fool for worshiping that. No, put your trust and uh, direct your worship to the true and the living God who sits in heaven and looks down low at us. Now, uh, verse seven says, as for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. 
the high places also of Avon, that empty, stupid city. The sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come upon their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Now, Hosea is saying the day of judgment is near. It's close. Uh, the, the the city where those gods, those false gods are going to be destroyed. They're nicely uh, uh, manicured and well uh, flowered uh, place, high places where they did their worship. They're going to have thistles and thorns and weeds growing over them. They won't be so beautiful anymore. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be growing over. And then during that day of judgment, they shall say to the mountains, cover us and to the hills fall on us. That ought to sound familiar to you Bible students, because over in the book of Revelation, the same thing is said to be said at that time uh, during the great tribulation and over at Revelation 6 and 15. We'll turn there. Revelation 6 and 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? <laughs> ah, this is this is this is reminiscent. We're getting a small picture here in Hosea's day of the day that's coming when God shall come, when Jesus shall return and come through that sky, and all men shall run from him because they shall know that they are sinners and that they're not ready to face their God. Oh, this is this is serious. This is intense. <laughs> Let's get ready for the return of our Lord. Now, verse 9. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood, the battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity, uh, did not overtake them. Now, this is a reference. This, this reference to Gibeah is to the book of Judges, and Judges about the 19th chapter. Uh, in the book of Judges, the children of Israel, had entered a time when they were living in horrible sin. And every man did what was right in his own eyes, as it says over and over when you study that book. And at this time, there was a, a horrible thing that happened there in Gibeah. There was a, a, a Levite man who uh, had went to Gibeah, and uh, his, his concubine, his wife, had went there and had left him. And he she had went to her father's house in Gibeah. And so the man, the Levite man, went to go back and bring his wife home and all of that. Um, uh, actually, it wasn't in Gibeah. It was in a, a town near Gibeah. And so uh, he collected his wife and he was bringing her home and they stayed in Gibeah. And so in Gibeah, while they were there, these men come out and they attempt to rape the man. It was just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And so rather than raping the man, the, the, the concubine, the wife was thrown out and they raped and they raped her all night and killed her. And so this man, uh, this this man, the Levite, uh, chopped his wife into pieces. Now, this is all there in the book of Judges, <laughs> chopped his wife into pieces and sent a piece of his wife to each tribe of Israel, alerting them of the damage of the horror that had been done to his wife there at Gibeah. And so it united the nation, all the other tribes, to go down to Gibeah and kill all the men there who were uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, that's a horrible story, but it says it, 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 it says something to us. Number one, it, it talks uh, to us about what was said earlier about them not respecting the king. Uh, that and being a rebellious people, because there in the book of Judges, when you read that story, it it it, it, it what's referenced there is the fact that at that time Israel had no king, they had no leader, they had no 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 authority, uh, and so that that lack of authority, either by men or by God, led to the horrible lawlessness and sinfulness uh, that resulted in that story. So that's that's really why that story is there, I believe. And the other point is that just as the nation surrounded Gibeah uh, to destroy them for what they, they had done to that man and his concubine, God says now the whole world is getting ready to surround Israel in judgment because of their iniquity, just like the men of Gibeah in that day. Oh, this is dark. This is dark. Verse 10, it is in my desire that I should chastise them and the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. They're going to be surrounded. The Assyrians are coming down. 
The Babylonians are, are coming down. They're going to be surrounded and they're going to be destroyed because of their sin and their iniquity that God is going to judge. Now, verse 11, and Ephraim is, a, is as a heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn. But I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plow and Jacob shall break his cloth. Now, what he's saying here is that uh, he says Ephraim is like a heifer. They they prefer to tread the corn, tread out the corn. That just means that they they like to go through the field. A, a, a heifer will go through the field freely, you see. And we see in the book of, I think it's Deuteronomy, also quoted by the Apostle Paul, that you don't muzzle the ox as he treads the corn. In other words, you let him eat. So he gets to walk through the field and uh, he gets to eat out there. But God said, because y'all want to be yoked up to these false gods, <laughs> you don't get to be free like the heifer. No, he's going to put a yoke around your neck and you're going to be plowing the field. You're going to have to work <laughs> and you're going to have to break up the cloud. That's how sin is. Uh, sin looks uh, appealing. Uh, it looks easy and fun, but it's actually work. Uh, you, you, you will work in sin. You will rest in Christ, but you will work in sin. Now, what do I mean? I mean this. Suppose you go out and you 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 begin to uh, have an inappropriate sexual relationship with somebody who's not your wife or your husband. Uh, and so uh, everything seems nice, it's exciting at first, but then you got to uh, you got to go through the heartbreak. You got to you got to deal with the broken family. You've got to deal with the, the 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 diseases that may come. You've got to deal with the money issues that come from uh, splitting up splitting up your household and your children breaking down. You got to work on that. You got to work. But if you will just do what God says, you see, if you just live life the way God says live, then you get to rest. You see, <laughs> you get to rest in him and in his way. Uh, he said, Jesus said, my burden is easy and my load is, is light. And so take my yoke upon you, you see. And so what you want to do is you want to be with Jesus. You want to do what he said do rather than being led by led around with the yoke of sin around your neck. And that's the message that Hosea has for them here in verse 11. Now, verse 12, so to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Hosea has given them that universal principle that we've said so many times in this study, and that is you shall reap what you sow. And so if you sow to yourself in righteousness, you're going to end up with the mercy of God on you. <laughs> Do what's right, friends. If you're ever trying to figure out which way to go, if you're ever trying to figure out what to do, Always first ask yourself, what's right? What is the right thing to do? What is the way that would be the way that would be pleasing to my God? And that, would, that should make your decision all the most simple because it may not be the easiest way. It may not be the, uh, the way that, that gets you the most friends. It may not be the way that ends up in the most money. But I tell you what, the right way will always give you a good night's sleep, brother. <laughs> the right way will always have you resting in him. And so you want to do the right thing and seek his seek his face and seek his will. And then he says, break up your follow ground. Break up that hard ground, he says. Uh, too many people are hard hearted these days. Too many people can hear this word and just ah, keep on moving on. I've heard that a million times. You hard hearted and you're also hard headed. <laughs> but Hosea says, break up that hard ground of your heart. Break up that hard head of yours. Moisten it. And then when you when you break it up, seek the Lord. <laughs> it is time to seek the Lord. This is a message that is that is good for any time. Good times, bad times, times of revival, times of judgment. It is time to seek the Lord. Whenever you hear this, you could hear it when I'm recording it here in 2024, or it could be 50 years from then. <laughs> Whenever you hear this, please understand it is the right time to seek the Lord. You got to seek the Lord. And that's how uh, that's how you will make it in this life. And then he says, you seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Friends, when you seek the Lord, that's exactly what he will do. 
He will rain his spirit out on you. He'll pour out his spirit on you. He'll give you peace when you shouldn't have none. He'll give you joy when it seems like you shouldn't have any. He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Uh, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. <laughs> uh, they shall run and not be weary. I think I'm, I'm quoting that right. But anyway, <laughs> that's what you want to do. You want to put your mind on the Lord and keep your mind on him. And you, that's where you want to be. That's when you get the righteousness. That's when you get the mercy and all the wonderful things that Hosea has talked about here. Now, he says, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you did trust in your way in the multitude of thy mighty men. And what a mistake it is to put your trust in yourself, to put your trust in your own decision making. No, my friend, put your trust in him. Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. and He shall direct your path. <laughs> That's what you need. You need a guide, friend. You need somebody to direct your path for you. You know you've messed it up by yourself. You know that you've followed yourself down the road of darkness, down the road of unhappiness, down the road of discontent. Well, now, why don't you put your trust in him now? Why don't you let him lead the way? You will never regret doing that. I'll tell you that much, my friend. Now, verse 14, therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled, as Shalman spoiled Betharbel in the day of battle. The mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. Now I'm going to read from Dr. McGee's commentary on, on verse 14 here. He says, Shalman is an abbreviated form of Shalmaneser, the name of the king of Israel. Beth Arbel apparently refers to a place the Greeks call Arbella. It is in the northern part of the country of Israel in the region of Galilee. It seems like there was a battle that at this place, although it's difficult to identify in secular history just which incident or battle is being referred to in this verse, because apparently there were many. Now, he says, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. This was a method used not only by the Assyrians, but also later on by the Babylonians, and is mentioned by the children of Israel as they wept in Babylon over at Psalm 137. It says, O daughter of Babylon, who who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes thy little ones against a stone. And so what's being described here is a is a brutal practice uh, where the, uh, the 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 soldiers of the conquering nation would come in and basically they would kill the children and the mothers. And they would, they would, <laughs> he's describing here them beating the children with the body of their mother. That's wicked and it's brutal. But it was a practice that happened in the ancient world. But verse 15 says, so shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. Now, this is literally happened. The Assyrians did come. The Assyrians did come upon the northern kingdom, and they did uh, invade this place, and they did do horrible things to these people, and they did drag many of them out of the nation into their own land. And it was a horrible thing, but it was a result of their walking away and turning away from God. You see, had they put their trust in him, he would have defended them. Those same Assyrians go actually go through the northern kingdom and they march all the way to the southern kingdom and up to Jerusalem. But they were stopped there because God stopped them. Uh, Hezekiah put his trust in God. <laughs> and Hezekiah went to the altar and cried out to the Lord. And the Lord stopped that army from coming through the gates of Jerusalem. And when you read about that at about the 37th chapter of Isaiah, as well as in 2 Chronicles. But the point is, this horrible thing could have been avoided had they put their trust in God. There's a horrible thing out in front of you, friend, and a horrible thing out in front of me. And it's more horrible than even this brutal brutality we've just described uh, that the Assyrian army will bring on. It's something called hell. You see, the Assyrian army only brutalized people for a short while, but hell is eternal. 
Hell is it has no exits, and hell will be there for you'll be there forever and ever. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. And so the way to escape hell is the way they could have escaped this this horrible Assyrian uh, brutality. That is by turning to the Lord, putting their trust in Him. You can still do it if you're hearing my voice. Put your trust in God. Repent. Turn to Him now. We'll cut off there and pick up again next time. Until then. God bless you.